Well, good afternoon if you are on the storm-battered east coast of the United States. Good high tea time if you are in Ely, England. Good evening if you are in Berlin, which is going to be a focus of our discussion tonight. I'm Fred Plotkin. This is Fred Plotkin on Fridays. Welcome to this program, sponsored by, presented by Adagio, the place where classical music happens. Adagio, as you know, is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to fans all around the world. As regular listeners and visitors know, I like to talk about things that inspire me and interest me and intrigue me and share them with you. In some cases, I present people I know well, uh, talking about things that I know well. Today, I'm presenting an author who I've never met before a couple of minutes ago. I've read her wonderful book. Her name is Elaine Thornton, Giacomo Meyerbeer and His Family Between Two Worlds, a really marvelous book. And we're going to talk a lot about not only music and opera in the 19th century in continental Europe, but about the social, the political, the religious, the uh, prejudicial, the revolutionary, the whole, everything happened at once, it seemed, in Europe, much of it overlapping the lifetime of Giacomo Meyerbeer and his family. So Elaine Thornton, welcome. Thank you for this great book. Thank you very much, Fred. I'm delighted to be here with you. Um, Normally, I say I don't know where to start, but I do know where to start. <laughs> I've asked you to read a section from the beginning of your book that I think will set at least one course on the table of this discussion. So if you please. Hey, certainly. Put my glasses on to do this. So this is from the prologue. On the 14th of October, 1801, in the Prussian capital of Berlin, 10-year-old Meyer Beer gave his first public piano recital, playing Mozart's concerto in D minor with variations. The concert had been premiered 16 years previously in Vienna with the composer himself at the keyboard. It had since become one of the most popular pieces in the piano repertoire, as well as one of the most demanding for the soloist. Meyer's performance received enthusiastic reviews in the German press. The influential Leipzig music journal, the Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung, reported that Meyer, described as a Jewish boy of nine years old, had made the concert more interesting with his excellent piano playing, accomplished mastery of the most difficult passages and other solo movements, and a delivery of rare sensitivity for his age. Meyer's parents, the banker and sugar refiner Jacob Beer and his wife Amalia were thrilled. To mark this success, they commissioned a life-sized portrait of their son from the fashionable court artist Friedrich Georg Reich. In Reich's painting, completed in 1802, Meyer, an elfin figure with artfully ruffled black hair and large dark eyes, stands with an air of innocent self-conscious pride beside his piano. He is dressed in the height of elegance, in a short black jacket with a red collar, yellow trousers and white stockings. In his right hand, he holds a piece of sheet music. His left hand rests casually on the keys of the piano on which a score by Mozart is visible. The underlying message is unmistakable. For Meyer's parents, their boy is a second Amadeus in the making. The portrait was exhibited in the Prussian Academy of Arts, where it attracted a good deal of attention, not all of it favorable. No one had any fault to find with the artist's execution of the painting, but some of the visitors found its subject offensive. For these people, the Jews could have no place in respectable society, let alone in the hallowed halls of the Academy. Chief among the objectors was the lawyer Karl Grattenauer, an outspoken opponent of Jewish rights 
and the author of popular tracts deriding the Jews' aspirations to European culture and to Prussian citizenship. In other parts of Europe, the Jews' situation had begun to change for the better. In France, they had been emancipated in 1791 in the first flush of revolutionary fervor. But in Prussia, they were still officially treated as aliens, denied citizenship, subjected to demeaning regulations and barred from almost all the professions. According to Karl Grattenauer, the Christian population had much to fear from the granting of equal rights to the Jews, the most dangerous nation on earth, a plutocracy without morality or true religion. His most vicious invective was reserved for those Jews who had integrated socially and considered themselves cultured. He made a derisive reference to Meyer's portrait in one of his pamphlets. The Beer family are said to have withdrawn the painting from the Academy as a result of this public humiliation. Two centuries later, Weitsch's painting of Meyer is now in the Musical Instrument Museum in Berlin, where it is displayed as the earliest known portrait of Giacomo Meyerbeer, the most successful opera composer of his time. In the mid 19th century, Meyerbeer's works dominated the international stages, creating and typifying the grand opera style that characterized the era. His most popular work, Les Huguenots, was performed over a thousand times at the Paris Opera from its premiere in 1836 up to the Second World War and was staged all over the world, from Buenos Aires to St. Petersburg, from Cairo to the Dutch East Indies. In his lifetime, Meyerbeer was a household name. Monarchs showered honours on him, opera houses competed for his latest works, and ordinary people whistled and sang his airs in the streets. When he died in Paris in 1864, a special train was commissioned to carry his body to Berlin, where it was met at the Potsdam station by a huge crowd, headed by Prince George of Prussia. Thank you. What that section at the beginning of the book, so be it is the very beginning, so beautifully sets up is almost everything that follows. So as a writer, I admire you for grappling with this massive theme and condensing it right there and laying down just about every single thing that you address at great length, but never boring length and with beautiful scholarship, I must say. Um, that made this book a page turner for me because um, as listeners know, my background is also 19th century history, but Italian primarily. My point of view is basically from Milan and other cities in the north of Italy toward the rest of Europe. Whereas this book is really from Berlin and Paris and to some degree Vienna and bits of Italy. And I think the first question I'd like to ask you about Giacomo Meyerbeer before we get to his family mm. is I never thought of him really as being a part of the Italian scene. I know that he wrote operas in Italian uh, and he adopted, why is, why is his name Giacomo, by the way? And why were his first operas in Italian? Right. His initial name, it's, was Maya Beer. So Maya was his, his first name and um, Beer is the family surname. Mm -hmm. And when he went to um, Italy in 1816, he had taken on his father's name of Jacob as, and he Italianized it into Giacomo. So, and then he had put together his original first name and his last name as, as, as Maya Beer. But he'd actually started writing Maya Beer as one name much earlier. So in about 1810, 1811, he'd started using Maya Beer as one name. Um, but Giacomo was, was, was Jacob. He occasionally also called himself Jack when he was um, in, well, in I know France. that, but I have to tell you as a, an Italian speaker, Giacomo is not Jacob, it's James. Is Giacomo it? Giacomo Puccini is James. 
Yeah. That is so interesting. So Jacobe, G I A C one, maybe one C O B B E is mm -hmm. Jacob in Italian, but Giacomo is James. Is, is actually, is actually James. Yeah. Then it certainly is a complete mystery as to that's, why he, he took that's that. That's the only the thing in your on. book that I didn't get a satisfactory answer to. Oh. <laughs> Well, um, I apologize. No, I not apologize at all. It just struck me because his name is such a hybrid. It and is. I, I, it to is. the degree that names identify ourselves and who we are, he made a conscious decision yeah. to change his name yeah. very early on, whereas most of the other people we can think of, Giuseppe Verdi, Richard Wagner, Wolfgang Amadeus, who had a longer name, Mozart, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, all of them, Ludwig von, well, actually Beethoven added the von, his father did. But um, for this, for Meyerbeer, was, it's as if he was changing his stripes a bit or his identity for different places. And yes. the reason that I asked that is not to be picky, but because... Mm -hmm. I think it had the effect of making him an outsider in places and may have laid some of the groundwork for the problems that he encountered that we will talk about. Hmm. Um, because sometimes you are exotic and interesting in a different place, um, but sometimes you are a rank outsider and not made welcome because you are perceived as different. Hmm. And if you, if you are known to be Jewish in the case of Giacomo, My well, let's call him Giacomo Meyerbeer. Um, and then you're called Giacomo, but you were born in Germany. And it, I just wondered is all. Um, James Joyce named his children with Italian names because he lived in Trieste. Yeah. And so that, that happens and that's fine. I'm not questioning that. But those were the names that he and his wife Nora gave to their children. But it's kind of like you were saying that he became Meyer Beer. Um, Cheryl and Tarkasian became Cher. And we know her as Cher. Yeah. And Beyonce Knowles is Beyonce. And there are many people we know by their single name. Um, whereas other, most people we know by their names. But when they become a single name or a different name, that already sets up a whole pathway of identity, mm. not only the way people identify them, but the way they see themselves. That to me was a question that I had about Giacomo Meyerbeer because did he do that, I wonder, because he wanted to identify more with the Italian opera scene and gain acceptance in Italy where there are Germanic surnames, but typically when there are like Hermano Wolf Ferrari um, is Hermano, Herman. Um, and this was, I, I think we should say right away, and I want you to chime in on this, mm -hmm. a time when Italy was not a nation and Germany was not a nation. Right. There was the Austrian empire, which in 1866 became the Austro-Hungarian empire. There was the Republic of France, which had been the kingdom of France. There was Great Britain, England, and, and different parts. There was, very importantly, uh, the Danish-Norwegian monarchy or empire. And, of course, there was the Russian empire of the Romanovs and so forth. These were the big empires at that time. But most, and Switzerland was sitting there doing nothing. But most notably... Germany and Italy, what we now call that, were not nations. And this is a central issue in 19th century culture, art, and politics, but also in your book and also in the life of Meyerbeer. Um, start talking about his birth in Berlin in, in Germany and his family, because one of the many things I loved in your book was Yes, we know Giacomo Meyerbeer, but he's placed in the context of the people who came before him and the people who surrounded him. And more than most biographies I've ever read, 
I had a very strong sense of who the subject was based on the people and the context he grew up in. Yeah. Um, can I just say about, um, about Italy that later in his life in the, in the 1830s, he, he did say that um, Italy and France are the only hospitable countries in which I've been able to practice my art, while Germany has rejected me and heaped scorn on me. So I do think he felt, as, as, he, as he said, that in Italy and France, he, he didn't feel that he was looked on so much as a Jew or that that was so important. And he felt more relaxed in the atmospheres of, of, of Italy and, and in, in Paris and able to work there, whereas he wasn't in Germany. So it, it, it may have been that that was um, a, one factor in him wanting to take an Italian name, that he actually felt, felt easier there and wanted to feel at home there and perhaps wanted to take on some of the identity um, of, of, of that culture where, where he felt safer, I think, perhaps, than, than in Germany. About Germany and, and the Germany he was born into, well, it's not called Germany, well, he was born well, into Prussia. Prussia. Yeah, in, in, into Prussia. Um, as, as I learned a lot about Prussia in your book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's a very it's very it's very interesting state. Um, yes, you, you you want me just to to talk about Meyerbeer's um, background um, and his family um, in Berlin, and as was probably uh, clear from from the reading from uh, from the prologue, um, he he was born into a marginalised um, community, the Berlin Jewish community, and it was a community that. Um, during his, his childhood and his adolescence was in a period of um, transition and I think quite a painful transition and, and, and an upheaval and that was because it was um, the, 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 the last third of the 18th century and into the early 19th century um, the European Jews were beginning to emerge um, from isolation from um, cultural and social isolation, and in some cases also from the physical ghetto. So there was still um, a ghetto in Frankfurt am Main in Germany. Um, I keep saying, I say Germany, but take it from talking the Holy Roman Empire. I usually, in the 19th century, I talk about the German lands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, is, it, is, it is the best phrase. Um, yep, so in Frankfurt am Main, um, there, there was a Jewish ghetto, which was one long street, which was locked. Um, it was locked from the outside at um, evenings, weekends, Christian holidays. Um, because it wasn't allowed to be extended, the houses had, as the population had grown, the houses had gone upwards, so they, they touched, the roofs touched. Not very much light came in, not very much fresh air. So that was was a ghetto actually in the German um, lands. Berlin didn't have a ghetto, but the Jews lived um, in, 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 a, in, in an isolated way, socially, culturally, from the surrounding um, society. And it wasn't until the, um, as a consequence of the Enlightenment, then the French Revolution, and, and of course in the 19th century, um, the Napoleonic Wars, which carried the the ethos of the revolution um, around Europe, that the Jews began to, to emerge from this isolation. And as well as cultural aspirations, um, and they began to embrace, um, in this case, German uh, culture, as well as cultural aspirations, um, there was, of course, a campaign for um, Jewish uh, civil rights, for, for Jewish equal rights, and for um, in the Berlin Jewish community's case for Prussian citizenship. And this campaign for equal rights started in um, 1786 on the death of Frederick the Great. And it actually continued and it wasn't achieved until 1812. So Giacomo Meyerbeer um, was not eligible to become a Prussian citizen until he was 21 years of age. So throughout his childhood and his adolescence, he, he lived through this period of campaigning for equal rights and of the Jews moving into um, embracing wider um, German and, Euro and wider European culture. 
and he was part of the the, the first generation <clears throat> that, that really became became active in actors um, in culture outside the the, the Jewish communities. Um, it the 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 call for Jewish um, civil rights um, and the, the 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 Jewish move to embrace culture German culture provoked hostility, um, as you've seen from the reading in the in elements of the or sections of the um, of Christian German society. Um, Karl Grattenauer, I've quoted from, um, he was something of a demagogue, but um, it, it wasn't just the de demagogues who, who expressed this kind of hostility towards um, towards Prussian to, towards Jewish aspirations. The philosopher Johann Fichte said in, 19, in 1792 that um, the only way that Jews could ever become um, Prussian citizens would be if all their heads were cut off in one night and replaced with heads that have not one Jewish idea in them. And the, the, the feeling behind this that, that, that you see keeping recurring is that the Jews are somehow immoral by nature um, they are somehow dangerous and that we as Christians need to protect ourselves from, from this threat and we need to do it by controlling the Jews. So there is, there is that reaction from um, sections of, of Christian society who are saying no, um, we do not want Jews to, 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 to have equality and to, to integrate with us at all in any way. But there was also tension within the Jewish um, community because traditionally um, the, 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 the Jews had, had been a, a, a dispersed nation, diaspora, um, and with the um, waiting to, to return to the Holy Land. And the fear was that um, once you start integrating with society around you, are you going to lose the cohesiveness? of Jewish society and is Judaism going to start to, to fall apart? Where is this all going to lead to? And where is it going to, 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 to leave us? Is it going to be actually the, the end of us? Um, so those were the fears within the, the Jewish community about integration and about um, civil rights. So there, 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 were, there was hostility on, on either side to the idea. So it was, it was a painful transition and um, a, a, a historian of the time, David Conway, has said that, and I think this is a really good comment, that the, the changes that happened at that time didn't only, see, didn't only involve a change in the Gentiles' perception of the Jews, but it involved um, a change in the Jews' perception of themselves. Mm. And that was obviously a, a, a difficult process that took, took time. And Meyerbeer would have been um, very, very aware um, of, of the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, would have been very, very aware of the um, emancipation struggle that was going on in, in, the, in, the, in the Berlin Jewish community, um, partly because he was a part of it, of course, but also because his, his grandfather, his maternal grandf grandfather, um, whose name was Liebman Meyer Wolf, was one of three men chosen by the Jewish community of Berlin to negotiate with the Prussian authorities for um, emancipation for the Prussian Jews. Mm -hmm. So Meyerbeer's grandfather was a leader in this process. And Meyerbeer's grandfather was also um, chief, um, elder, chief elder of uh, Berlin's Jews from 1799 onwards. He was an extremely wealthy man. Um, and he was also um, an, in, an influential leader of the Jewish community. So Meyerbeer would have been a very aware. And he, I think, he did grow up feeling that he was different. And this comes out very much in, in his diary. Um, throughout his life, actually, entries in his diary reflect that feeling that, that, that he expects to, 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 to meet prejudice and discrimination. And when he's a young man, he, he writes that he, he was in an inn and he was treated badly and derided by some young women there. 
and he said that this um, wounded him to the depths, depths of his heart. And he says in his diary, when will I finally learn to accept peacefully what I know to be inevitable? And then much later in his life, um, when he's in his 50s, uh, he's in a spa called Frant uh, the Spa of Franzenbad, and a Prussian general who is also there gives a large dinner um, in commemoration of the late Prussian king's birthday. And he invites every single Prussian in the spa, except Meyerbeer, the Jew Meyerbeer. And Meyerbeer again notes this in his, his diary and says, you know, the general invited every, everybody except me um, to, to the, 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 the dinner. And he, he comments always the same old story. So his, his, his origins always go with him. One of the many questions that popped up for me that I wanted to ask you is, he spent a lot of time in spas. Yes. Yes. Why? In Belgium, in Austria, in, I think we now yeah. call it the Czech Republic, and obviously in Germany, in Italy, I think, too, or what is now Italy. Yeah. Um, why? He, he did suffer from health problems. Um, from, from quite a young age, he, he first starts writing about health problems um, when he's in his 20s. He talks about coughing up blood. He has um, stomach problems. And these seem to plague him all his life. And in fact, his, his father, Jacob, not James, but definitely Jacob, um, died of a bowel complaint. Um, and Jacob had had a bowel complaint for some time. And... Giacomo Meyerbeer seems to have very similar um, symptoms to, to, to his father's. Um, it's, it's possible that it was a, a, a type of bowel disease such as Crohn's that, 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 that could, could be passed down from father to son. So Meyerbeer frequently um, writes in his diary um, about his, his health. He worries about his health almost continually. Um, his wife, Minna, also has delicate health. Um, in fact, she spends a lot of her time in spas um, and it, it causes a bit of a crisis in their marriage in the 1830s because Minna feels she cannot live in Paris because her health won't stand it. Um, she, she prefers Berlin um, where, I mean, she's Meyerbeer's cousin, so she, she's also a Berliner. Uh, she prefers Berlin and she prefers traveling around German spas um, for her health and says she simply cannot live in Paris, whereas Meyerbeer feels he simply cannot live in Berlin because, as he says, he, he is only comfortable um, being able to practice his art in, 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 in Paris at that time in France. I want um, listeners to know that Paris in the 1830s was the setting for Puccini's opera La Boheme. Oh, yes. There are so many updates of it that we don't realize it actually has a date on it. It is 1831 or 32, um, at a time when Belgium was convulsing and there were revolutions in the opera house there. Yeah. And there was a lot of poverty in a lot of places. And um, certain kinds of social systems that were available later to people throughout Europe or most of Europe were not available then. Germany and Switzerland and to some degree Austria were ahead of the curve. Uh, and I believe some of the Nordic countries, especially Denmark, less so, and Sweden, less so in Norway and, and Finland. Um, but you could die young in Europe at that time. And many people yeah. did. All the, the British authors and the women authors and who died young and then you know, there are so many Verdi operas where the hero, heroine or the hero has a father but no mother. Yeah. Because women died of so many things at that time that it was a constant in Verdi's operas. So we, at a distance of being in 2021, where all we have are pandemics um, that some people choose to try to vaccinate against and others not, that you could just die very easily in the 1830s. You could step on a nail and get tetanus and die. And yeah. And also people people didn't understand um, what 
what caused various illnesses. They didn't know what they were, so they couldn't be treated because they didn't know. I mean, for example, people thought cholera was caused by a miasma in the air, but it was carried in the air. And so if you, if you, if you, if you didn't know what caused the illnesses you had, um, you didn't know how to treat them, it must have been terrifying every time you felt ill. Yeah. because you didn't know what was going to happen. And this is really, this is something that, that happened within Maivir's family. His um, youngest brother, Michael, died in his early 30s. 33, yeah. And Michael um, was taken ill and he, like, like, like many people, he'd had a bit of a weak chest, he had various illnesses. He didn't take it seriously. Um, and within within days, it suddenly turned into a fever. He was seriously ill, and he was dead. Um, so you, you, I suppose, life was much more uncertain, wasn't it? And you, you just couldn't tell, and you didn't know whether something you had was going to suddenly turn into something fatal, um, and that it, it nothing could be done about it because it wasn't really understood what what caused it. So, yes, I, I, I can. I, I can see that that, that um, it, it would be frightening, and if you were prone to to, to weaknesses and illnesses, um, you would be very very frightened about it. And people believed going to spas um, regulated your health, kept you healthy. And I think um, both Maya Beer and Minna, a, a lot of their letters to one another are filled with details of their health and worries about each other's health. So it was a, a preoccupation between the two of them. And um, so they, they, they did tend to spend a lot of their time um, traveling around, around spas, as did, um, as did uh, my best parents, particularly his mother. Yes, mother. well, she lived to 87. She lived to a grand old age. Oh, she did, she did. She, she was, was a very formidable. strong woman in many ways, yeah. I think. Um, I think a stroke took her, but um, yeah, at eventually. a rather old age in a very formidable life. I want to get back to her a bit later. Yeah. But just sticking to medicine for a couple of more minutes. Yeah. Um, Rossini, who was a great champion, he's one of my heroes. I mm -hmm. was a great champion of Meyer Beer and a lot of other composers, Wagner too. Um, Rossini was a champion of Wagner. Um move to france people always say oh for the food italian food is fantastic he yeah. did not move to, it, to france for the food he moved to france because rossini at the tender age of 14 contracted syphilis mm -hmm. and the in the usual way and the mm -hmm. doctors in italy even in bologna which had the best medical school in in Italy, and that's why Rossini lived in Bologna to go to the music academy, but also the doctors there. Mm -hmm. um, finally, there was nothing they could do. So Rossini in his 30s moved to Paris for medical care. And he lived mm -hmm. to 76. Uh, Donizetti got better medical care in a way in Paris than he did in Italy. He, he died of terrible mm -hmm. disease, he was quite he young. Did. Um, Bellini died in Paris. A lot of these people died in Paris. Uh, Mozart's mother died in Paris. A lot of people got sick in Paris. But um, Berlin and Vienna were ahead of the curve in terms of medical research. Mm -hmm. And I know that many composers and leaders of different fields went specifically to Vienna because the quality of the medical care was and remains very good. They, they've always put a, a emphasis on that. But even they did things that were completely mistaken. In Vienna, um, they, without getting too complicated with it, they had a habit of sharing needles for vaccination, spreading illness around. They didn't realize that that could yeah. actually make you ill. And it was not until a Hungarian doctor figured it out and 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 was much criticized for, for breaking with the establishment that suddenly Vienna had a breakthrough on um, hygiene and needles. And Paris and France, Louis Pasteur, England a lot, actually. Um, medical, the issue of medicine and the arts and medicine and, and war and so on is a fascinating thing that doesn't get explored all that much. 
And so one thing I, among the many that I admired in your book was that I, I felt the presence of looming death because of illness for mm. so many people. And a lot of people died in, in your pages. Yes. And... <laughs> I didn't kill them off though. No, I know, but I read it. I was reading it like a, it was like a grand novel, except that it was true. <laughs> it was just so well researched. And, you know, suddenly Meyerbeer is called here or there to look after a brother, a relative, someone dying all of a sudden. And Meyerbeer's and... first two children dying um, at, at just in, in their infancy. Verdi's two children died too that way. Mm. And it was very common. I mean, and his wife within the space of eighteen months, his two kids and his wife yes. died. Yeah. yeah, I thought, by the way, that was I thought Rossini um, suffered from depression. He also suffered from depression, which is so interesting because we think of him as so the Italians say brioso, full of brio, and <laughs> because we hear that in his music, but he yeah, was yes. definitely impressive. And isn't isn't it extraordinary that somebody who, who suffered from depression? could create such sparkling, beautiful, entertaining, comic offerers, as well as his more serious offerers, but, but that he could give that to, to people when he himself was, was, was leading in, in quite a tragic life. And so there's a bit of a theme here that we're teasing out, although I didn't plan it. Um, some of my favorite composers were all undervalued in their mm, lifetimes. Mm, mm. Haydn, I think, was valued not as well as he should have been, but he was valued to some degree and he lived pretty well. But Rossini mm. and Berlioz, who are my two favorite composers, All right, okay. um, were completely undervalued. And you were talking before about Meyerbeer not being appreciated in Germany, the German lands, but in France. Berlioz had the opposite problem. He was not appreciated in France, but found acceptance in Germany. And Meyerbeer, when, as we'll talk about, when he had a position, a court music position in Berlin, invited Berlioz to Berlin. Yes, he did. Le Troyen was done in Karlsruhe and not in Paris or mm. in another French city. And these two men, but also Meyerbeer, I began, I didn't know enough about Meyerbeer that I could speak about him the way I can about Rossini and Berlioz. Um, there were so many similarities that Meyerbeer, full of gifts and generosity, actually, the way Rossini was exceedingly generous financially, but also morally, um, they were quite alike. And mm. they had... And we'll get to him into him later, inevitably, as Wagner. Both Rossini and Meyerbeer gave great support and encouragement and money to Wagner early on. Oh, yes. Yeah. A lot of money. Yeah. And they also, when nobody would take Wagner seriously in Paris, they did. In and 1839, 42. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. They, they, they did. They did. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, yes, I mean, well, perhaps we'll get on later to yeah. talk about Wagner, but, but I think that period of 1839 to 42 is quite important in, in uh, Meyerbeer and Wagner's relationship. We'll talk about that now since we're there, 1839 okay. to 42. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, because um, most people start with, with 1850 and, and, you know, jury in music or Judaism and music, however you want to translate it, but um, I would say jury in music. I would prefer that Judentum in der Musik. But actually, that I think to, to understand what happened, you have to know that there is a is a, is a hinterland um, with Wagner and and Meyerbeer going back to um, over a decade before the publication of of, of that uh, article, eighteen thirty nine, when Wagner comes to Paris as as a young and a, a young composer without a real track record of success. He's written Bifeyan and Das Liebes Verbot, and he's just mm -hmm. finished Rienzi, um, which I, I mean, I would say Rienzi is a, is a grand opera, would you? Well, it's grand in both senses. It's imitative and evokes the Meyerbeerian style, but also it's a terrific work. I love Rienzi. Sure, sure. Yeah. I, just, <laughs> I, would, I, would, I, would, I would think of it as being a grand opera, but yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. Um, so he's, he's, he's written those three, but he's got no real track record of success. But he comes to Paris um, 
the, the center of the the music the, the operatic world at that time of course he wants to to break through and become successful have big success um and he turns to my beer because my beer by that time has um had huge successes with Roberto Diablo and with Le Huguenot, he's on, on top of the, uh, the, the, the profession. And he's the most influential opera composer, um, certainly. He's, he's the person that um, Wagner wants to, 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 to get hold of in Paris. And uh, he, he meets Maivir, who's very interested in Rienzi, who listens to it and who's, very, who's impressed by it. Um, Wagner writes some very, a series of quite strange letters to, uh, to Maivir. Um, some of the some of the th things he says in them are, are quite, quite obsequious. Um, I'm, I, I know I must be your slave in mind and body, he says in one of his letters. Um, he signs another, your belonging. And something else, I, 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 I am your subject in heart and blood, I think he says. Um, and then he also, <laughs> he also, sorry, I'm laughing, but I find his letters quite, quite it. I mean, it's quite amusing in some ways. And he says, um, at some future time when I have no doubt whatsoever, I will be amazingly famous. And you can almost hear Wagner saying that, can't you? And of course, he was quite right. Um, he, he was going to become amazingly famous. And he also peppers the letters with, can you, can you lend us some money? <laughs> um, which, he, I mean, Meyerbeer certainly wasn't the only person to, 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 to be expected and Wagner money, but he 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 writes he writes these and letters. many were Jews. Now that I think about it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I so, hadn't associated that, but many were Jews. Yeah, so Wagner um, asks my beer to to help him, and you, I think when you're thinking about it, you've got to to try and get rid of the the, the hindsight that this is Wagner, the, the the creator of the great sublime ring cycle, the the, the the god of the demigod of Bayreuth, and you've got to see him as my beer would as a, a completely unknown young man um, with no track record who's writing these letters, telling him he's going to be amazingly famous, and, and, and asking him to help him break through into, um, into the Parisian scene, as it were. And Maya did my beer really does try to help him. He my beer writes to his agent in Paris, Louis Gouin when my beer is actually in Berlin for a while saying, this young man interests me. He has talent and passion. And he introduces um, Wagner to various people, um, particularly the, the director of, as he was then, of the, the Renaissance Theatre, which agreed to, to stage the Sliebersberg mm -hmm. I think I'm right in saying the theatre then folded, so it never actually happened and Wagner's mm -hmm. hopes for that were dashed. But he also, Meyerbeer also introduced Wagner to um, the new director of the opera, to the conductor of the opera, to various singers. Um, and Meyerbeer also wrote to both the Dresden and the Berlin um, opera directors, recommending Rienzi to the Dresden and recommending um, my, uh, Wagner's fourth opera, um, the, the, the Flying Dutchman, to, to Berlin. I'm going to interrupt you there for a reason. You touched on something that I made a note to talk to you about. Oh. Um, in, speaking of the German lands, I wrote Berlin, Prussia, Dresden, Saxony, Munich, Bavaria. Yeah. And Wagner was from Dresden, from Saxony. He was born yes. in Leipzig, but grew up in Dresden. Yeah. He made a lot of his later fortune in Bavaria. Yeah. Um, he did conduct occasionally in Berlin. There were, of course, other major cities such as Hamburg and Leipzig was a major musical center, especially for music publishing, but also education. Um, and Frankfurt, to some degree, and Stuttgart and many. And that's the fascinating thing about the German lands is because they were separated until 1871. Each one built a remarkable musical culture that competed with the next one which is why Germany now is the beneficiary of so many opera houses and theaters and music conservatories, because there was not one national school like Paris. And it, that is a real advantage. I mean, the first time I ever saw a Meyer Bay opera was at the Bielefeld Opera House, mm -hmm. um, a small, I, 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 well, smallish provincial opera house. Yeah. I saw a production of, of La Fricaine, only it was called Die Afrikanerin, as it was, mm -hmm. had been translated into German. I, I, I didn't know anything about my beer at that time. I had vaguely heard the name. 
And I had the opportunity to see this, went along and was, was blown away by it. But it's, it's, it's a provincial opera house, yet it was putting on a, a Mayavir um, opera back in the, the, the 1990s. That was my first contact with Mayavir. Mm -hmm. So going back to the going 80s, back, 30s, yes. Um, Meyer Beer helped Wagner a lot. He did, and yeah. when he, you know, when he wrote, he, he genuinely sympathised with him and helped him a lot. When he wrote, when Meyer Beer wrote to the director of the the, the Berlin Opera about um, the Fliegende Holländer, you know, he he said, due to given Wagner's um, talent and his extremely difficult circumstances. I'm just trying to get this right. He doubly deserves that the doors of the German uh, court operas, which are the protectors of German art, should not be closed to him. And I think that's quite a, a strong statement. Um, and I think he did, he really did his best. But when you read later on um, Wagner's letters to Liszt, for example, in which he, he talks that the, the period when Meyerbeer pretended to be my protector. And he, he very interestingly describes, um, tells List that the, the, the relationship of patronage, of, of the, the, the patron and the, the beneficiary, is one of the most perfect dishonesty on both sides. And he, I, I, I feel that the time, that particular time in um, in Paris for Wagner was a time of humiliation because he never, he, he didn't succeed. This was the center of, of, of opera. He, he, he felt he should succeed there. He felt he was ready to, and it didn't happen. And I think he, he associated Meyerbeer with that humiliation very much. Um, that's interesting because when you think about the different times in their lives that Wagner and Meyerbeer came to Paris. Um, Wagner had, had, had written three offers, was writing a fourth. He had no track record of success, yet he expected to, to become a big success there. But Meyerbeer had spent eight years in Italy. He'd written six offers, um, which had become, made him more and more successful. The last one, Il Pratato in Egitto, um, was um, the most successful. It made him a. It, it was success. It made him famous throughout Europe, and he was invited to come to Paris and to to, to bring Il Crociato to Paris, um, and for Rossini to 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 to, st to produce it in the um, the Italian theatre. So Meyer was already well known, and he was invited to come, and I think maybe Wagner. Um, it was too early in his career for him to make that big breakthrough. And he does say in his um, autobiography, Wagner does say that Meyerbeer did that hint, hint that to him at the time. He suggested that perhaps he was being a bit ambitious and should perhaps mm -hmm. lower his sights slightly. Um, but I, I, I do think that, that, that that was a time of humiliation for him. And I think he strongly associated Meyerbeer with that. And then later, in the late 1840s, Meyerbeer stopped lending him money, which was an additional um, cause of anger, I think, for, 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 for Wagner, um, who, who was in, in, in poor circumstances. But um, I would he, guess he was in poor circumstances. He was a terrible money manager. Yeah. yeah. Richard Strauss and Giuseppe Verdi managed their money well. They, they, yeah. they built their careers. It's possible. I'm not saying that every creative person is a good money manager, but Wagner was notoriously bad because he could always put a touch on a woman, on Mathilde Weisendonk or her husband, yeah. Otto. Yeah. He always, or King of Bavaria, he always figured out how to get enough money to keep himself rolling. Yeah. But and, and both both the Heinrich Heine, the poet who was also a, a, a sort of uh, uh, had close relations with the whole of the Beer family, um, very difficult relations um, with, with both Michael Beer and, and Meyer Beer. But he was also an inveterate borrower from, from Meyer Beer. And because Meyer Beer was wealthy, I think people felt they had an a, a right to, to, to expect money from him. And in fact, Heine said to him, um, 
it quite makes me laugh. It's 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 a bit of cheek and it's quite funny. He said to to my peer, basically, well, he should give me money because um, four hundred francs means the same about the same to you as one franc means to me. So what's your you know what's your problem yeah. with giving me money? But you know, I, even the wealthiest people surely must must object to being used as a kind of cash machine. A kind of hole you know, in the wall cash machine for. I for, respect that, but I have, because I work in opera and because there are many wealthy people who support opera, I have often been with exceedingly wealthy people who, billionaires, who don't even have money in their pocket to get home. And they ask me to pay for their cab fare <laughs> home. This has happened many times. Or. Okay. Would you get the meal this time and I'll do it next time? And then that doesn't happen. The next time never comes. <laughs> the next time never comes. And, oh, oh, oh well, can you get it again? Because uh, you know this restaurant. They know you, so you pay. There are always these reasons. And I'm not, I'm not at all saying that all wealthy people are like this. But I have had the experience at a few occasions yeah. that somehow they never can, can produce funds in their pocketbook or their wallet. Um, which is just an odd experience. I know a woman, I'm not going to talk too much about her, who is a theatrical producer on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And she never had 15 cents in her pocket. She had the money <laughs> elsewhere, but it just, it could never materialize. And I think that she always thought people liked her for her money. And I, you know, I can see where the concern about having the the touch put on you becomes annoying, certainly. But um, Meyer Beer strikes me as someone who was innately gener uh, generous and kind. You address in your book the concept, the Jewish concept of doing a mitzvah. It's a blessing to do good things for others. And that's and what he says to his mother about giving money to to his old um, librettist, I, I kind of Rossi, when Rossi was... was um, poor in his older age in Italy. Yes, but wasn't that librettus the one who gathered all kinds of flowers for his mother's garden in Oh, Berlin? yes, and sent them to, <laughs> to, to Madame Beer, Dame That's of the a Order wonderful of part. Of, I mean, there are many wonderful parts in the book, but I particularly loved the idea of Meyerbeer's Italian librettist looking for plants and seeds all over Italy to send to Berlin. His mum. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, I forget great. how was it addressed to it was something like um the it was it was to, servant to, to the queen or the, the dame of title. the dame of the order of Louise. Dame of the order of Louise. <laughs> which was the order she was um the, the award she was given by the 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 uh, the Prussian king for her, her philanthropic philanthropic work in the Napoleonic Wars. So I mean the all of the beers were generous. They were they were philanthropists, and you know, in fact, Heinrich Heine um, said charity is a, a virtue of the Beer family, and I think they 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 were all philanthropic in different ways, and certainly Amalia um, gave of her her time herself um, as well as her her, her money, and the the Karl von Holtai who. who the, the, an acquaintance in Berlin said if, if he ever met anyone who needed money he'd send them to Amalia because he knew that she would be able to she would help them not just that she would be able to but that she, she, she would help them. And so let's talk about Maya Beer. He had two brothers mm -hmm. and his three brothers. Just, three you're, yes you're right of course. Don't forget the black sheep. The black sheep I, I am forgetting the black sheep you could talk about that um but his mother in the best sense seems like a remarkable and dominating figure in the formation of her children and their outlook and on the city of berlin and on prussia she was originally from vienna no she was berlin oh sorry her, her ancestors her ancestors, her ancestors i'm Austria. sorry were from vienna that yep. struck me because you write about how they all had to leave vienna all of a sudden yeah. And many of them found their way to Berlin. So I think of that because, um, well, I'll take it back further. My name is Frederick. So anytime there's a Frederick, I tend to read up about that one. And there was Frederick the Great mm. in Berlin, who 
I frankly had a pretty good impression of as being in somewhat enlightened in many ways until I read your book <laughs> and discovered that he was not so great in certain ways. But I not if you were so Jewish, for sure. Right. But I always saw him as the parallel to Empress Maria Theresa of the Habsburg in Vienna and in the Austrian Empire of 1740, 1780 in terms of fostering culture and civic works and architecture and building theaters. And, but I guess there were, there were parallel in time frame and in some ways in terms of creation of a great city, but mm -hmm. apparently not others. And it struck me because I think of Maria Theresa's Vienna. Yes, there was absolutely anti-Semitism, mm. but, um, there was everywhere, but somehow the environment of Berlin, which to me had struck me as a more welcoming place historically. I love Berlin. I lived there and, and I Dajo is based in Berlin and, and it's one of my favorite places in the world. But the Berliners I know are very open and accepting and, and uh, transgressive in a, in a charming way. And, 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 and yet Berlin has this Prussian history. That's what I said to you at the very beginning. Wow, the things I didn't know about Prussia. Mm -hmm. That the Prussians, to me, <clears throat> Berlin, Berlin is open and easy and liberal and so on. But Prussia was very regimented and strict and, and judgmental. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was the world into which Meyerbeer was born. Yes, it was. In in. In, in, when he was born, the Berlin Jews um, were subject to Frederick the Great's Jewish regulations. Um, and, and really what Frederick wanted from that was to ensure that the Jews he had in Berlin were wealthy. He wanted it to be a wealthy community. He didn't want poor Jews. Um, and there were various levels of toleration in his um, regulations. You could, you could only live in any city or town in the German lands, if you had a permit, if you were Jewish, you couldn't move somewhere. And in Berlin from 1750 onwards, um, the, 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 the right you had to live there was defined by your wealth. So at the top of the pile were those Jews who had a general privilege and um, Giacomo Meyerbeer's grandfather was one of those at the top of the pile with the general privilege. That meant he had, not only the right to live in Berlin all his life, but to give all his children permits. Um, so they would inherit the right to live in Berlin. Next level down, you had the right to live in Berlin all your life, but you could only um, pass that down to one child. Mm. Next level down, you had the right to live in a level of wealth, this is, and you, you, you had the right to live in Berlin, but none of your children could inherit that. And as for the people who were workers, you know, the servants or the butchers, or they only had the right to live in Berlin as long as they held that job. So mm -hmm. your, your rights were, were, as to residence, were defined by your, your, your wealth. And also um, the, the, the regulations all, all also specified um, where the Jews could live, how many houses they could own in Berlin, if they, it was very limited number of houses that were allowed to be Jewish owned and um, what kind of work they could do. So it went into some quite detail as to what work they could do. Um, and almost all, of course, trade, it was trade business usury. And they were kind of forced into that um, and not given access to, to, to other jobs. Um, they couldn't, of course, um, join guilds, so they couldn't become craftspeople, etc. cetera. Um, and even, even marriage, they, you, you had to have permission to marry and you had to pay a tax and they had to pay a special tax every year. Did you have to have permission to marry another Jew? Yes. Ah. Oh, yes. And you had to pay um, a tax as well. Mm -hmm. um, so th these, these regulations covered almost every, every aspect of um, the lives of the Jews of Berlin. And to a great extent, they were still all that, they, they, they carried on until 1812. Um, when um, the Jews were, were, were formally emancipated and, and given Prussian citizenship. So it was, it was, for the Jews, it was a highly regimented and regulated um, 
existence. There wasn't a ghetto as there was in Frankfurt and Main, um, but they were very regulated. And of course, they, 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 they tended to live close to one another um, because a, a cohesive, um, if you belong to a cohesive society in their situation, it was a, a, a kind of protection against the outside world, which, which could be hostile. You, you, you naturally stuck, stuck together. And so Amalia. Yes. <laughs> you know, when I first started, um, started writing this, um, which was, gosh, back in, in uh, 2008, I first, I checked the other day, it was uh, my first sort of jottings down were in 2008. I'd, I'd come to it through being interested in my beer's operas and then I'd become instantly fascinated by his family. And I actually wanted to centre the book on Amalia um, at that early stage. And I started writing a book centred on, on Amalia, but I, because I found her such a fascinating character. But I soon realised it, 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 it wouldn't work as a book because, as a, as a woman of her time, Amalia was focused on promoting um, her family and particularly her sons and their careers. So the more I tried to write about Amalia, the more I was writing about the rest of her family. And I, I realized, no, this has to be a, a, a book about the, the whole family. And of course, my beer is, is the best known, but it, it is um, in essence a, a family biography. As I say, I wanted to start with her. Yeah. She was just so fascinating. So parallel, oh, one thing before we get to the, the parallel I was going to bring up, Reform Judaism mm. and its role in the Meyerbeer family and their synagogue. Talk about that aspect of their life in Berlin. Yeah. Uh, Meyerbeer's parents, Amalia and Jacob, were modernizing, forward-looking people. Obviously, they, they, they embraced German culture um, enthusiastically, but they wanted to remain Jews while moving into to, to, to European culture and accepting European culture. They wanted to remain Jews. And this was, this was quite, quite um, difficult at the time because Many people were, many Jews were actually in the Berlin community were converting to Christianity, not because of any religious belief, but simply because they felt that there was no alternative between um, traditional Judaism and being baptized. There was no way to take part fully in, um, in, in German society without losing Without, without having to, 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 to become Christian. And it was either separatism or it was baptism. And my best parents are pioneers in the sense that they, 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 didn't want, they, they didn't want to accept those as alternatives. They were determined to, to remain Jews, but to become actors in the wider society. And I think, it was really the, the, the sort of creation of a new German Jewish identity in that period. And I feel they, they contributed towards that. The synagogue reform, question of synagogue reform is really part of that um, assimilation of um, German culture in that Jacob Beer felt in about, he started in, in 1815, um, he believed that, um, that the, the younger people in the community weren't learning Hebrew. The services um, in the synagogue were in Hebrew. They were, they were completely traditional. The rabbis, um, many of them didn't speak, actually speak German. They only spoke Yiddish. And in fact, the, um, the rabbi of Berlin of the time had, had an interpreter to help him with German. And as um, Jacob Beer said, the rabbis can only talk about Talmudic disputation. The younger people don't even understand that. It's jargon to them and they don't understand Hebrew any longer. So the services mean nothing to them. So people were drifting away. And as I say, people were converting because they could get jobs that way. And also if they had lost that, that, that tie, that feeling of relevance, 
um, from from their faith, then it, it it made it easier for them to move away. So Jacob um, and the, the Beers didn't didn't weren't, weren't active the very first instigators of, of reform. This came from a man called Israel Jacobson, who um, during the Napoleonic period. Um, set up, established a temple in, in Saison near the Hartz Mountains, which had services that were, were based more on the German Protestant um, type of format and used the German language to, to some extent. Mm -hmm. So there was a German, there was a sermon in German, some of the prayers were in German. There was also a, a, a choir and an organ, um, which there hadn't been, it, it had been not been allowed in, in the traditional synagogue. So it was kind of on the, more on the style of, of the, the, the surrounding cultures, church services. Um, and I would interject and disagree if you wish. Yeah. Um, the word reform Judaism, therefore, based on what you're saying, seems to grow out of the concept of reform Christianity. There was the Reformation in 1565, but that was really against the excesses of the Catholic Church. But this notion of reform observance of Christian faith went much further, and a lot of it was in Switzerland, in parts of France, Alpine France, in Germany, in the German lands, um, and took root and is really part of German Christian practice. So yeah. maybe there was a mirror of that as an example mm -hmm. that could inspire reform Judaism. You, you, you could actually parallel the, the change from um, Latin as the church and service language to, to the local language, from Hebrew to the local language. So there, you, can see, you can see parallels. Um, so going back to, to to, to how it started, Israel Jacobson moved to um, Berlin when um, Westphalia folded at the end of the um, Napoleonic period when Napoleon was, was, was defeated. He moved to Berlin and he um, set up uh, a, a, a synagogue, a reformed, a new type synagogue in, in some rooms in Berlin, but basically he, he didn't have enough space. It started to become popular. And at this point, the beers decided that they would offer their their large house, and mm -hmm. they would like to 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 have the reformed synagogue in Berlin in their large house. Um, they had the space, and they had the, the 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 wealth to 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 be able to take this on. And they 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 altered three rooms in their house, um, and it's. it's it's interesting because they had three rooms. They had the central area with the art, and then two two rooms for seating on either side, facing the centre. And on one in one of those rooms, um, there was seating for men, and the other room there was seating for women, and there were separate entrances. But both men and women were seated in the body of the synagogue, and. This was I real. Clarify, as opposed to women being up in a balcony. As yeah, I was just going to say, traditionally, yeah. women had been either in a balcony or behind a screen, or even in a, a separate building, um, being being taught uh, prayers in Yiddish by uh, by a senior woman. So women had not been on the, the, the floor, as it were, on the ground of the the, the, the synagogue. And even in Israel Jacobson's new um, synagogue in um, Westphalia. Um, the, the, which is the very first, the very first reform um, synagogue. Um, he had women and balcony, so this um, this, this 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 real innovation um, in the beer the beer temple, as it was called, um, was that the, the women were on a level with men in a different room facing them, but on a on a level. And interestingly, one of the um, historians of reform Judaism, Michael A. Meyer says that um, it's, it seems likely that, that Amalia Beer was, was um, you know, behind the plans to, I'm paraphrasing him, behind the plans to, 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 to have the, the, the temple in, in her house. Um, she was a devout woman and she would no doubt have um, wanted to, to, to forward this. And it did herald a change in the position of women in Judaism, um, where the, the emphasis moved from being scholarly knowledge of the law and, 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 and 
Talmudic disputation and focused so much on men and became more about personal um, spirituality and, and, and ethics and included brought in women um, very much more. So I, I think the beers were, were, were really right at the start of that. And the, the other innovation in their, their temple was the confirmation of two girls in 1817. And of course, the, the bar mitzvah had always been purely male. Boys were called up to, to, to read the Torah. You could correct me if I'm wrong, but that called up to read. At 13, yeah. At 13. And of course, only boys could do that. Um, so there wasn't an equivalent um, girls' right. But Israel Jacobson had introduced um, a confirmation right for, for, for boys, which was, uh, was, was similar to a Christian, more similar to a Christian confirmation right. And I, I'm, I'm in, in uh, to put it quite right, the, the confirmation of the two girls, first time that girls had been confirmed before the ark in the synagogue. And um, it very nearly brought about the, the, the closure of the temple because the, the Prussian king, Frederick William III, heard about this. He read about it in the paper. And he was um, a, a very conservative man who, was, who was, had a particular fear of the formation of sects, religious sects. He felt that they, they spelt anarchy. And he was uh, very much afraid that, that the, um, this new movement, this new synagogue movement in Judaism meant that the Judaism was going to split and intersect. So he, he wanted to put a stop to it. And they only escaped the, the temple being completely closed down at that time by the skin of their teeth. Mm -hmm. But it was later closed down. Um, in five, five years later, in, in um, 1823, by the king, who was working with the more traditional elements of the, the Jewish community, the more, called, so call them the more orthodox elements. Both sides wanted to see an end to the reform for different, we, different reasons, um, but they, 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 they worked together and the king um, in 1823 um, just put out a, a complete ban and said there can only be the, the one communal synagogue and there can be no question of any alteration to the traditional right, any introduction of German, it's all, it's all finished. So it was closed down by the, by the king. That, that ended it in Berlin. Um, it wasn't until the 1840s, 50s that, that reform came back to Berlin. But the people who had worked, um, the, the lay preachers in particular who worked with, with the beers went out to, to other places such as Hamburg, um, mm -hmm. where um, it was a little, a little more liberal and they, they, the movement continued slowly and, and gradually, gradually grew. Thank you for explaining that. The part of why I brought up the topic is because I found it revolutionary that, in effect, uh, Meyerbeer's mother was creating a situation, beneficial situation for women and young women, that must have, based on my understanding of Meyerbeer through my study and especially your book, made him a more open man, not only in terms of religious beliefs and doing the mitzvah of being generous and so on, but his understanding and his promotion of women. Yeah. And I will leave it for our viewers to go study Meyerbeer's operas and come to his own conclusion about women in those operas, because they're fascinating characters that I think in some ways anticipated the women of Wagner, but that's for a whole other time. Um, but also because Amalia had four sons. Yeah. Giacomo had three daughters. Yeah. And they all are very interesting characters, those three daughters that you describe in the book. Talk about them briefly, if you will, but I don't want to go too much on that digression, except to say that it struck me that the way Amalia formed Giacomo, Giacomo, even in his absences, contributed to the formation of his three daughters. And they represented in a way, uh, they were Blanca, Cecily, and Cornelia, Corneli. Um, they formed a late 19th, early 20th century template for different paths that women went down. Mm. 
and I see that going all the way back to the grandmother and Minna, uh, Giacomo's wife, but especially from Amalia to Giacomo to the three daughters. I think, yes, the, 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 those, those four women are all very strong, I think, strong characters. Um, all three of um, Giacomo's daughters converted to Christianity in order to, to marry. In fact, no, the, 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 the Blanca, the eldest, converted before um, her marriage. I mean, do, with, it's kind of inevitable, given the circles that they moved in, that they would they would end up marrying Christian men in in, in either either the artistic world or, or high social positions, and there wasn't the option for civil marriages or, or, or mixed marriages, so they converted. Blanca, the 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 eldest daughter, is is interesting because she she converted to Catholicism. Um, when she was, I think, I think 16, and she had been fascinated, she'd been drawn to and interested in Catholicism and, and decided at, at quite an early age. Mm -hmm. um, so she must have been quite a, a strong person, I think, decided to, to, to be baptized into the Catholic faith. And um, Maivio accepted this. He accepted his daughter's choices with great equanimity. I, I think he, he wanted what was best for them. Um, but they they did they did decide to try and and, and hide Blanca's conversion from Amalia because they felt it yeah. would it would upset her too much. But um, she did find out. I think somebody showed her a newspaper, and it was in the newspaper. So um, she was she was always going to find out at some point. But then Blanca married a um, a, a Prussian army officer um, who <laughs> he, he turned out to be a bit of a gambler and. Uh, in my idea, was uh, constantly being called on to to bail out this this son-in-law. Uh, the 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 middle daughter um, had what seems to have been a form of anorexia in her her youth. She um, she was only apparently weighed five stone at some. She was quite a tall girl, so she 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 had some kind of she had some kind of wasting illness, which sounds very much. Like so for our non-British people, because when I read that, you wrote, I forget if you wrote five or five and a half stone, but I computed oh. it to be 77 <laughs> US pounds, okay. which is 2.2. Um, it's 50 kilos. Right. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I can't no, do it the other 50, way around. 20. <laughs> yeah, I, I just can't do it the other yeah. way around. I, I, think you're, I think you're right. Um, Yes, I'm. No, I tell you, I tell you what, thirty-five I'll, I'll, kilos. Thirty. It's thirty to thirty-five kilos. It's yeah. It's very. It's yeah. very. It's, it's anorexia nervosa thin. Right. Um, but she she recovered from this. So again, I think she must have been quite a, a strong character because, of course, at the time they wouldn't have known much about it. Um, so she wouldn't have had any 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 treatment or, or mm -hmm. any effective treatment. I wouldn't have thought. But she recovered from that. And she married um, a man who's an anthropologist. She lived to a very old age, like Amalia, and she lived in Salzburg in her old age. And she, she took a very, apparently in her 90s, she took a very lively interest in life around her. Said to have, um, you know, got, gone in the hotel she lived in to have gone down to listen to the jazz and to have sat enjoying the jazz in her 90s. She was, she was again, another quite strong woman. Um, now, I think it's one of her daughters, Gabrielle von Wartensleben, became, um, was, was I, th I think, the first woman to gain a PhD from the University of, of, of Vienna, and she studied Gestalt psychology and wrote several um, articles and, and a book, all contri contributions to, to Gestalt psychology. So she is, again, there's, there's a pioneer in the family. We're going down a generation again from, from um, the daughters. I think she's Cecily's daughter. Um, and um, Cecily's son was a friend of Hugo von Hofmannsthal. And I love that, yeah. Director <laughs> um, of the, was it the Burg Theater in Vienna? My, my, I think my brain's frying slightly. Um, so yes, friend of Hugo von Hofmannsthal. Right, well, Hofmannsthal was the librettist for Richard Strauss for 
in addition to being a great writer, poet, man of the theater, but we know him for Electra, for De Rosen Cavalier, for Ariadne of Knox. I love De Rosen Cavalier. Arabella, for those yeah. operas. And one of the founders of the Salzburg Festival in 1920, along with Strauss. I had a few weeks ago the now retired head of the Salzburg Festival, Helga Robel Stadler, uh, which viewers can find. And I will send you that conversation. It's mm-hmm. about the genesis of the Salzburg Festival. Oh, how interesting. And Hoffman saw was there. And um, these. Well, continue. there's a link with my beer through. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I mean, and they're Cecily. Strauss, and, and it's really, yeah. it's remarkable yeah. the degree to which the artistic world blended and was affected by the political world. Thyroid is a whole thing unto itself. We're not going to go there now. But um, do you know if there are any descendants of the Meyer beers today? I think there is um, a very elderly descendant of my beer in in berlin yeah but i'm not sure quite how yeah. that how that comes down i haven't i haven't tried to 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 follow the family further than than, than going down for, it becomes a little bit that's actually a wonderful topic for a book and article i mean the mozart line has ended for example mm. and the verity line depending who you talk to probably has ended although one person contends that he's a descendant um, the Wagner line is very much with us, mm. for example. Um, the Rossini line, I don't know much about that one. But um, so now I think inevitably we have to, well, before we get to Mr. Wagner, <laughs> um, you gave me, as I asked my, my guest to do, a really wonderful list of music that in most ways deepens and and inspires more thought about uh, Meyer beer, about the Meyer beer family and your topic. Obviously, Les Huguenot, you have a section from Les Huguenot. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have to go there because listeners can go there. Boito's yeah. Mephistopheles. Yeah. Is that the Goethe connection through Faust or why Boito's Mephistopheles? If you um, I just think it is the most inventive, extraordinary, unusual, attractive offerer. And yes, there's also the Goethe's Faust link that um, I love Goethe's Faust part one, part two is a bit difficult, but Goethe's Faust part one is interesting. And to me, Boito's is by far, I love the Faust story, and Boito's is by far and away the, the, the version of it that attracts me the most I and that I find the most fun and just quirky and inventive and absolutely delightful. Um, it opens, for heaven's sake, with the prologue in heaven, mm-hmm. and with the, cher- the, the, the cherubim and the seraphim and with the devil strolling on to, to um, talk to the almighty, who he calls the old man. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and it's exactly, this is, this is Faust's prologue. Down to, to the devil coming on and saying, um, uh, you know, I like, I like, I don't, I like to talk to the old man from time to time. I don't like to upset him. And after all, it's jolly decent of him to talk so so civilly with the devil. And, so, and it, it's it's in Boito, and I think that is incredibly bold to 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 stage the prologue in 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 heaven. And he mm-hmm. does that. Um, I think there's a few wonderful music in it. Um, awesome. Absolutely gorgeous. I mean, Faust, is it Day Campy Day Party? is absolutely beautiful. And it, it, it just grips you all the way through. Mm-hmm. But I, I chose um, the, the particular um, piece where, where Mephistopheles reveals who he is to, to Faust, because I, I think it, it sums up in some way, the, the the whole of the opera, the quirkiness and the 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 absolute charm of it, and I also love it. It starts off again. I am the spirit who always negates. Is is the direct quote from from Goethe? Mm-hmm. Ich bin der Geister stets verneint, and I'm not even going to attempt to do it in Italian because I can't. But it's uh, it's 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 wonderful. I've Como never heard. Anything... Che nega sempre tutto. 
thank you that's lovely <laughs> <laughs> and um i just i just think it is so unusual and it just puts over the character of of this, this Mephistopheles, this particular devil. It's his cheek, it's his utter cheek, his cynicism, his, his, he's a braggart, um, and he's quite funny. And it's the, it's, it's the, the, the whistling is quite mm -hmm. extraordinary. Who else would think of doing that? Mm -hmm. you know, you, and, and yet it sums up this attitude, this, you could even say devil may care attitude. <laughs> and ha ha. And I, I um, every time I, I listen to it, it makes me smile, you know? And I also like that you picked a, an old, not ancient, but old Bulgarian performance with yes. these huge Slavic voices rather than oh. the more famous ones that had uh, Norman Tragel, Samuel Ramey, wonderful performers who I love. But this one is Nikola Gyuzlev, Sevka Evstatyeva, Minko Popov. These are wonderful singers back from when Bulgaria was still not part of the world community. And they had wonderful opera in Bulgaria and these recordings that would come out occasionally. You'd think, who are these people? But isn't that the voice of the Mephistopheles? Isn't, I know. isn't it so perfect for... Yeah. For, for, for the role and for the song yeah it sounds wonderful it's 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 that depth and and that oh it's just, so just then it's terrific you think wagner's tannhäuser the overture music i adore that's my favorite wagner opera so yeah i love um, it so did you pick it because of the paris connection why particularly <laughs> that? no it's a personal thing okay um i i didn't grow up in a family where there was music um, very much. There certainly wasn't, there wasn't classical music. So, I mean, I do envy people who grew up surrounded by classical music as children, because I mean, I, I just didn't. I do remember an EP, <laughs> Mario Lanza singing The Student Prince. Mm -hmm, sure. Wonderful. But I, I didn't grow up knowing anything about classical music. But when I, I got to my mid-teens, I think I started listening to the radio a lot. And I started picking up on, on bits of classical music from the radio. I, I remember buying, rushing out and buying them. I remember Sibelius, Swan of Tuonola. I got fixated on that for a while. It's, it's a lovely thing. Um, but the one thing, I, one thing I heard that I simply had to buy on the radio was, was the Tannhäuser Overture. And they just played the overture. And I saved my money and rushed out and bought the whole Opera, and of course, at sixteen, with no previous knowledge of, of classical music, it, I, I couldn't cope with the whole opera at that at that age, at that time. I think you have to grow into things. Mm -hmm. um, but I listened to the opera. Sorry, to the overture. I listened to the Tannhäuser overture again and again and again and again, and it just—it was my first experience of how classical music can actually kind of transport you. Mm -hmm. And it, it really did. And I, I just loved it. And it felt like something special. I'd close myself in my room and draw the curtains and listen to the Tannhäuser Overture. And... Did you dance? Because that's, a lot of that is a dance segment. No, I, I don't. I don't. I didn't dance. I just lay there and let it kind of okay. <laughs> wash over me and, and take me away. But that, that's, a, that's a memory. Well, therefore, I, that I, I completely, completely comprehend because... Tannhäuser is on my very short list of favorite operas, period. Yeah, yeah. But you then include a, a modern masterpiece that is a great work that surprised me, Philip Glass's Akhenaten, yeah. specifically <laughs> the hymn to the sun. How do we get from Meyerbeer and Boito and Wagner to Philip Glass and Akhenaten? You know, I I don't, and I, because I, I, and I can't analyze music, and I don't actually want to um yeah i like to just I, I just sit back and listen to things that interest me and because i do i think it, it, it turns out to be it's extremely broad i mean there's things outside classical music obviously i listen to but within classical music i don't think i, I have this particular taste or that particular taste i, I love opera obviously um, but i just i just listen to things and, and i don't even know where i came across Philip Glass's Akhenaten, but I do know that I was immediately fascinated by it. 
And I, I think it is just a remarkable work. And there's, there's so many things that are remarkable about it. The, um, the fact that the, the libretto is in three ancient languages. It's, it's um, Egyptian. Except that this song, this aria is in This English. is what I was going to come on yeah. to, yeah. That's what <laughs> makes it so special. Yeah. Um, the, the, you know, the, the, the three ancient languages, Hebrew, Akkadian, and uh, Egyptian. And I haven't seen it staged, I wish I had, but looking at the, 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 the you know, the, 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 the staging, it's almost symbolic. It, it almost makes me think of Egyptian wall paintings and, and it's almost as if something is being reconstructed here with the, the, the ancient languages and, and the, 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 the symbolic staging, but you're, you're watching a reconstruction of something quite alien um, to you, something very ancient, truly ancient and alien. And I think the, the minimalist music really enhances that because it, it, it adds a kind of distant strangeness Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's a, a, an extraordinary work. The, the, the Hymn to the Sun, this, this central piece, is the only piece, as you say, that it, it's, I think the instructions say it's to be sung in the, the language of the audience. Yes, yes. Which means that Akhenaten, whereas you're watching almost like I say an ancient wall painting, Akhenaten is suddenly speaking to, to you in your language. And it's because he's talking about, uh, singing about, um, his inner religious feelings, which have led him to this revolution, this um, throwing out of all the old gods of Egypt and instituting the the, the art and the, the the sun as as the one the one god, and it's it's a revelation of, of his his personal feelings, and it's sung in 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 my version certainly in English, and I think there is such a, a quality of a kind of spiritual yearning in it which I find incredibly beautiful and I also think that Paul S. Wood's wonderful countertenor voice really enhances that feeling it it it, it adds to a kind of um, ethereal otherworldly um, atmosphere of, of of the hymn and I, I just think it expresses that 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 spirituality so beautifully. I mean, I, it's something I can listen to again and again. I love the Metropolitan Opera did a production of it, I believe co-produced. I don't want to, I think it was English National Opera, not the Royal Opera, Covent Garden. I think, you know, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, that they've documented on video that I commend to you. It stars Anthony Roth Costanza, a wonderful countertenor as Akhnaten. And if pandemic permitting you happen to be back in new york early next year the met is doing it again oh is it How Live, wonderful. Yeah. so yeah. There was one more work that you recommended that i focused i knew the other ones but the one i didn't know at all was by meyerbeer Struenze. and it's pronounced Struenze. Struenze. Uh, mm. what a fascinating work so yeah. his brother michael who was a playwright yeah. wrote a play about Johann Friedrich Stroenze, who lived from 1737 to 1772, yeah. Yeah. whose life was operatic. He yeah. was a, yeah. a German doctor. He was a great liberal. He was like Andrea Chenier, who sought to have um, reforms done, genuine reforms that benefited all people, getting rid of capital punishment and quite remarkable for the 18th century. And he became the doctor to the King of Denmark mm -hmm. and who was mentally here and not here on occasions. And when he was not there, uh, Stroyense had a relationship with the Queen of Denmark and they produced a child. And then he was accused of having seized too much power and perhaps influencing the King in a bad way. And he was put to death at the age of, I believe, 34. There's a wonderful Danish film of, of his life, Struense, which mm -hmm. is, is really, if you ever got, get the opportunity, is worth seeing. Well, I knew, again, because my Italian side and because I worked with Dario Fo, he wrote a play about the Mad King of Denmark. Oh, and really? Struense is a character in that play. Oh, he would, he would but be. I knew him simply as Il Medico, the doctor, yeah, yeah. I don't remember him being called Stroyense. And so the music that Meyerbeer wrote, I listened to it on Adagio, 
is glorious. Yeah, it's lovely. And it's so-called incidental music for a play. And I never liked the word incidental yeah. for a play. Beethoven yeah. wrote incidental music, um, sort of Mendelssohn. Which brings me to, I, tell, I want everybody to listen to this music by Stroy and say, brings me to Felix Mendelssohn, who does not come off all that well in your book. No. Uh, and he, he doesn't. Yeah. Well, can I, can I just say, yeah, let me just say sure. something, if, if you don't mind, about. Go about, right ahead. Um, and this, this is about how, how certain people appear in, in the book. You know, I watched your interview with Alex Ross, who mm -hmm. wrote that uh, the, the massive tone on, on Wagnerism, which I'm not going to pretend I've read, but it looks like <laughs> something you could dip into over the next few years. So I, I promise you. It is over my shoulder. I still see it on the bookshelf. <laughs> promising myself the pleasure of that at some point. But he said something about um, Wagner, and he said, uh, get this way, he said, Wagner was not one crisply, single, crisply defined personality. There were a multitude of, of Wagner's, basically. And I thought, yeah, that's, that, that's very true. And, but what, what also struck me is that in my book, I only show one of those Wagner's. And I show the, 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 the Wagner in, who is in, a rela in, in, in relation to um, Meyerbeer and his actions and his behaviour in relation to Meyerbeer, which is a perspective on him, but it's not mm -hmm. the whole person and it's 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 not a particularly flattering perspective because his his uh, relationships with 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 my beer were, were, were particularly difficult but then that is also true of other people in my book Heinrich Heine great and wonderful poet um appears as a fairly unpleasant character because yeah. his relations were difficult same with Mendelssohn I only really... I'm sorry to interrupt but with Heine I felt differently because in your book because he was a poet and mm. not a good money manager and he was immersed in his work. Mendelssohn, there were more parallels because he came from another incredibly wealthy, influential Oh, yes. Family. Yes, he did. And therefore, and one could compare them differently than Heine to uh, Meyerbeer. Yeah. And the Mendelssohns converted little Felix at the age of seven. They did, yeah. And he was baptized and mm, he was put mm. into reform Christianity, Lutheranism, and fine. But it was the route that that family took as opposed to the route that the Meyerbeers took, which is why the whole wonderful vein of the reform Judaism coming out of the Meyerbeer home and, and the way women were treated and uh, you didn't do it too much, but I thought about Mendelssohn's relationship with the sister Fanny, which was a little yeah. different, let's call it. And um, so therefore, Mendelssohn was assigned by the court, uh, by the king, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, to handle church music, whereas Meyerbeer yeah. in Berlin was yeah. in the early 1840s was assigned to handle opera and symphonic music. Yeah. And brought in Berlioz and Liszt. Right. And therefore, this converted Jew was the one doing re Christian religious music, yeah. Mendelssohn. And this reformed Jew was the one doing the other music. Mm -hmm. And they apparently didn't get along very well. They didn't. They and didn't. It's it's a, the what whole family, the family thing behind them. The Meyerbeers and the Mendels as being two formidable families. The I believe the grandfather of Felix was this grand Rebbe, this famous rabbi and scholar, Moses Mendelssohn. Moses Mendelssohn. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and four of Moses Mendelssohn's six children converted. Um, he's the most famous Jewish philosopher, really, of modern. Mm -hmm. Times and and four four of his his uh, children converted, including Abraham and uh, his wife Leah, Felix and, and Fanny's parents, who, as you say, had the children back all the children baptized when they were young. The parents didn't baptize at the same time because it wasn't a religious conversion. And Abraham writes to Fanny on her confirmation, telling her that quite clearly, I brought you up in the Christian faith because it's the majority faith in our. Um, in our, in our country and um, it's the sensible thing to do basically so the, 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 
the Beers and Mendelssohn's both lived in Berlin. The mothers were quite friendly. Um, mm. They were friends and rivals, rather, I think. Um, they took different paths. Um, there was a further um, link because Heinrich, the, the, the black sheep of the Beer family, married um, a Mendelssohn cousin. And um, it, was, it was kind of a difficult link because his life didn't go very well. <laughs> and um, the Mendelssohns were continually, I think, trying to, to they, they took some responsibility for him. Um, and Felix despised Heinrich Beer um, in particular, but his feelings towards all of the family were, were not friendly. The, 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 the generation of the parents, the, the Beers and Mendelssohns, were, were quite friendly, at least there's certainly no enmity. But the children, um, they're, they're, there's, there's this tension bet between them, certainly between, um, and I, I would say Fanny to an extent is, is also quite scathing about the Beers, but, but Felix feels, seems to feel quite strongly. Even, again, even about Amalia, he's, he's, he can be quite rude to and about Amalia. Um, I mean, I couldn't tell you where that came from with, 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 with Felix Mendelssohn. And it comes out quite early when he's 16 in Paris. He, he uh, finds himself, at the, he goes to the opera with his father and, and finds himself sitting in a box next to Meyerbeer, who's sitting with Rossini and lots of um, well-known musicians. And, you know, Felix writes back to his sister saying how, how they were all in the next box talking and laughing and says I, I nearly fell off my seat laughing at them you know there's even at that age there's some kind of resentment there um and it, it I don't understand it myself because I think they were composing in different fields and I don't see what reason Felix he, he never wrote um an opera well he did write an opera but he never had any yeah. any success he never um, wrote a good opera <laughs> and and <laughs> My Giacomo and Mina Maivir used to, to rather rather nastily call him Camacho in their letters to, to, <laughs> to one another. Um, but he, uh, I, I, I don't know why he seems to have taken the whole of the Beer family in slight, um, but he, he, it seems to me he, he did. And Maya Beer responded strongly by, by um, he called him my worst enemy. My deadliest enemy, who no, my worst enemy, who hates me to death. Mm. Um, my dear, called called Felix, which is very strong language. Yeah. Um, and he he actually left Berlin once when he heard that he, you know Mendelssohn was going to be at a dinner that he was going to be at. So there's there's obviously it's a, a huge antipathy there between the uh, the two of them. So I brought this up in part because I want listeners to know when they read your book, as they should, that. There are so many veins in this huge block of marble that are worth exploring because mm -hmm. and you researched it beautifully, but also the narrative is so strong. I ne it never wandered. And that to me was a remarkable achievement in the way you folded in all of this history, all of this religion, all of this musicology, all of the travels of going back and forth, all the spas all the family members, the intermarriages and the conversions and so on. It really, it read to me like a grand 19th century novel. Wow. <laughs> and um, I'm only going to touch briefly on the operas because mm. our listeners can hear them all on Adagio. Yeah. And, but I decided because I'm a New Yorker and I used to work at the Metropolitan Opera, mm. I wondered why I'd not seen much Meyer beer at the Met. So I did some research that maybe you're not familiar with. And I called the page Meyer beer at the Met. The Met opened October 22nd of 1883. And it opened with Faust. And then they had Lucia di Lammermoor. And very soon thereafter, within the first season, they had Robert Le Diablo, which when I typed is, my computer corrected it to Robert the Viable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Le Prophète and Les Huguenots, the Huguenots. Um, and they were performed in Italian because just oh, about really? everything that season was performed in Italian and for the next couple. And then the Met had new management. And by 1888, 
Les Huguenots Open was the opening night of the season, which was a big deal at the Met, but everything was done in German. And the music director was Anton Seidel, who conducted Wagner and introduced all kinds of works. And he led within the space of two weeks, Les Huguenots in German, Auf Deutsch, and then La Fricaine, the premiere, the Met premiere of La Fricaine was in German at the Met. And then in 1891, the Germans were out and the Italians were back and they did Dinora, as they call it here in Italian. Um, and then that was 1891, nothing until 1907 when La Fricaine came back because of the tenor Enrico Caruso. Um, it was a new production, the first time a new production was created after the first round of productions. Um, and then Le Prophet, I'm sorry, 1907, these old productions were revived. So Robert Le Diablo only had two performances, 1883. Les Huguenots, the last time, it was done 129 times between 1884 and 1915. That's a lot. Uh, Dinora only five times, the last being in 1925. L'Africaine 71 times, the last time being 1934. The exception is Le Prophète, which has been done 99 times at the Met, so not as much as Les Huguenots, 99. Right. Whereas Les Huguenots was 129, but constantly and then nothing after 1915. The mm -hmm. only production I ever saw at the Met was Le Prophète because the, the last Meyer beer done was La Fricana in 1934, where I was not around yet. And then in 1977, a new production, 77, yes, January 18th, James McCracken, Renata Scotto, Marilyn Horn, and Jerome Hines, a wonderful, mostly American cast, with the conductor, Henry Lewis, an African-American conductor, when it was rare, it's still rare, unfortunately, but more common. But at that time, it was completely rare to have an African-American conductor leading something like Meyer Beer at the Met. And he was the husband of Marilyn Horn at the time. And the production was John Dexter, British. Um, mm -hmm. You're going to love this. The production was John Dexter. The design was Peter Wexler. And the lighting was Gil Wexler on different <laughs> spellings. So Dexter, Wexler, and Wexler, and Henry Lewis. And it sounds like a firm of lawyers. It does. Everybody was happy to have it musically. Um, the production got a mixed reception, although I thought it was fine. John Dexter was a very modern conductor, and some I think people felt it should have been done in a big grand opera style. But the last performance of Le Prophet at the Met was October 26, 1979, and that was the last Meyer beer at the Met. Yeah. So that's 42 years ago. Yeah. And why? Not just for the Met, but why do we not see Meyer beer as much as I think, and I gather you think we should be seeing some of his operas? That's the question I asked myself mm -hmm. when I first started writing this book, because I had um, seen one of his operas um absolutely loved it um got to know when i eventually got to know more about um his his works listened to more of his operas i just i i found it all fascinating i, I found I, I got carried away by it the the, the 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 works are full of energy and high very dramatic high intensity energy um and i i think they're great theatrical i've only i've only seen two of them staged um, I saw Barbella Diablo in um, at Covent Garden um, in 2012. Um, but but when you see them stage, you you're, you're just taken in to 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 the world of the opera and carried along on a journey. And it's there's so much forward propulsion, and it's they're, they're exciting experiences. And so I was I was quite surprised when I I started um, looking at looking up my beer in in um, textbooks encyclopedias of, 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 of music of, and found that it's in a lot of them he doesn't appear he doesn't appear in some of them at all in others there's a short and, and quite often sometimes openly hostile 
um, entry. People, you know, descriptions such as, you know, overinflated reputation, cloaking mm. very little talent. Um, I, one um, particular textbook, I remember described Maya Beer's Grand Operas as gaudy, meretricious and inauthentic. That's and another law from gaudy, meretricious and inauthentic. <laughs> <laughs> It's or perhaps uh, a public relations agency. Exactly. <laughs> yes, that's definitely a PR agency. I don't know how much work they'd get, but it's definitely a <laughs> PR agency. But I, I found these things astonishing. And, and in particular, there seemed to be a suggestion that Meyerbeer himself, the man, it's not just criticism of the work, the man was somehow... I don't know, a, a, a charlatan or a, a fraud in some way. And this it just contradicted my, my, my experience. And I'd come to, to him without any preconceptions. And there seemed to be a very, a very large amount of received opinion about Maya Beer. And you'd, you'd mention his name and people would actually pull a face. And when you talk to them about it, you, I, I'm sure, I don't think some of them actually knew his music, but it, it wasn't. That was also the case with Rossini. And I have very yeah. knowledgeable musicological friends, either in the business or who are experts who are not working in yeah. opera, who say, well, he wrote a couple of good comedies, but really that's it. And all those crescendos and who needs to laugh. And I had a French friend who said that um, Rossini, no, but Offenbach, we. Oui. Because mm -hmm. Offenbach was droll, and I want to say, well, Offenbach was not French. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it wasn't. And, you know, we, it is a received thing. Yeah. And I think in yeah. the case of Meyerbeer, with all of his wealth, and I, you address this in your book, some people thought that he sort of bought his acclaim and that he could afford that just the way Mendelssohn's parents hired an orchestra for the young boy Mendelssohn to compose on. He had a whole orchestra to work with because they could afford it. But somehow Mendelssohn's works, I'm not saying one was better than the other, but have not been damaged by that concept of the family wealth. And I, I think also, as Leonard Bernstein famously, but inaccurately, but nonetheless famously said, I've traveled the whole world and I've never seen a statue dedicated to a critic. There are a couple, but um, I get his point. And I think what happens is we have received knowledge or wisdom or accepted uh, point of view that's very hard to beat. Mm -hmm. So Berlioz, drugs, over-enthusiastic, Haydn, structured, uh, not inventive. Um, Offenbach, uh, not, well, Offenbach too, never really wrote a masterpiece until Le Conte of Mann. Um, there are these composers, and Meyerbeer is one of them. The difference, I think, with Meyerbeer is that he had Richard Wagner describing who he was to a rapt audience. And as you say in your book, Wagner created these societies and ways of gaining tickets to Bayreuth. And he marketed himself very effectively. And you became an adherent to the Wagnerian shrine. And I will say, obviously, that I adore Wagner's operas with one exception Bye. and his music. And I, I've been to 48 complete ring cycles and I teach Wagner everywhere. So I'm not knocking Wagner's mm -hmm. output here, but he built shrines to himself. By Verdi built hospitals and homes for musicians. Wagner built a theater to enshrine his music. And if I may, I asked your permission before, I would like to read from late in the book yep. as more of an amuse-bouche for the listeners because it's just so interesting. Giacomo was aware that Wagner had criticized his operas, which was fair enough given that Wagner's views on music had changed from the days when he had written his own grand opera Rienzi in imitation of Giacomo's style. However, Wagner's treatment of Meyerbeer and his writings was becoming so intemperate that it suggested a personal loathing. The German music critic, Eduard Hanslick, 
when so far as to remark in 1875 that Wagner, quote, passes judgment on Meyerbeer, not as on an artist, but as on a criminal. Wagner was not in a good position in the early 1850s, more than a decade after his first approaches to Giacomo, he had not yet attained the overwhelming success that he felt he deserved. His personal life had also taken a turn for the worse. He had allied himself to the revolutionary cause in Dresden in the heady days of the 1849 uprising and had been forced to flee to Zurich as a political refugee. There are certainly worse places than Switzerland to sit out in exile, but his situation made it difficult for him to stage operas in Germany and his feelings of resentment toward Giacomo grew. Always the egotist. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Always the egotist. Wagner felt that Giacomo had not done enough for him. And the idea gradually began to take hold of him that he was being excluded from the theaters by the intrigues of the all-powerful Meyerbeer. The huge success of Le Prophet in 1849 was a turning point for Wagner. It had placed Meyerbeer in a seemingly unassailable position as the dominant force in European opera. Any composer who wanted to succeed on a large scale would first have to topple this idol of the public. Wagner's frustration turned into a determination to remove Meyerbeer from his path by destroying his reputation. Around this time, Wagner began to use Giacomo's Jewishness as a weapon against him. Wagner had to, had to come to feel that the pain Giacomo undoubtedly took to entertain and appeal to his audiences were evidence of a tawdry commercialism that desecrated real art. Wagner saw himself as a true German, devoted to his art for its own sake in contrast to Meyerbeer, the cosmopolitan international Jew who had turned music into a saleable commodity. In taking this stance, Wagner was most probably influenced by his friend, the violinist Theodor Ulig, who had already published several anti-Jewish diatribes in the Leipzig Music Journal founded by Robert Schumann, the Neue Zeitschrift für Musik. In 1850, Wagner submitted an article to the same newspaper under the <laughs> pseudonym of K. Freigedank, which means K. Free Thought. It was called Das Judentum in der Musik, Jewry in Music, and it was to become infamous. This first edition did not identify Giacomo by name, although it was perfectly clear from Wagner's comments that he was the main target of the rhetoric, along with Felix Mendelssohn, who had died three years previously. Both composers were named when the article was reissued as a pamphlet in 1869, five years after Giacomo's death. The inclusion of the convert Mendelssohn in the essay indicates the racial tone of Wagner's argument, which seeks to identify Jews as aliens whose Hebrew art taste debarred them from writing Western music. Wagner began by stating as a fact that all people are instinctively repelled by Jews. He asserted that Jews have no mother tongue and complained that their offensive speech patterns were automatically incorporated into their music, that is, synagogue music, which he characterized as consisting of gurgling, yodeling, and babbling noises. The basic theme of his essay is that Jews are naturally and eternally other and alien and have no art forms of their own. Consequently, no Jew, no matter how talented or educated, can produce real art of any depth, but only can superficially mimic others and so produce unnatural and distorted imitations of art. The article was not, however, a mere effusion of anti-Jewish prejudice, although Wagner did admit to Franz Liszt in a revealing letter that, I felt a long repressed hatred for this Jewry, and this hatred is as necessary to my nature as Gaul is to the blood. Thus, Judentum had a more specific aim alongside the promotion of Wagner's views on art. The contention that Jews were unable to produce authentic music was integral to Wagner's uh, portrayal of Meyerbeer as a charlatan. Wagner was always hot-tempered, 
but the venom in his references to Giacomo suggests a visceral hatred that is not explicable or justifiable in terms of their musical differences. Wagner told Liszt that he did not hate Meyerbeer, but that he disgusts me beyond measure and referred to the period of my life when he pretended to be my protector. No doubt the knowledge that he had needed Meyerbeer's assistance early on in his career had only served to increase Wagner's resentment. His comments in this letter on his view of the relations between a patron and the recipient of his benevolence throw an interesting light on his obsequious behavior towards Giacomo in the early years of the relationship. Quote, this is a relation of the most perfect dishonesty. Neither party is sincere toward the others, the other, one or the other assume the appearance of affection and both make use of each other as long as their mutual interest requires it, unquote. Wagner went on to tell Liszt that he felt a, a pressing need to separate himself entirely from Meyerbeer to disassociate himself from his former patron. So beautifully written. And again, this is near the end of the book mm -hmm. and without getting musicological, but purely historical and psychological, I think you frame very well part of the reason why we don't hear Meyerbeer's music. Yes, it was popular in the late, well, during his lifetime, but then in the late 19th century and into the early 20th. But with Germany becoming a nation in 1871, with France losing the Franco-Prussian War to Germany in 1871, with Italy becoming a nation at the same time, with nationalism rising, with anti-Semitism, not ubiquitous, but certainly present in a lot of places, and it would spike its head when there were economic turndown. Suddenly it was the fault of the Jews. Enough, I call it a virus. Mm -hmm. And all racism and all prejudice, not just anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. is a virus. We're seeing this in my country now against Black people and people of color, that it comes up. It's a horrible thing. And I think the virus, I hate to say this, these viruses are always going to be with us. and. So I think that at a certain point, Meyer beer went out of fashion mm -hmm. with the rise of fascism in Europe in the 1920s. That put paid to Meyer beer in a way. It and bad. it was reflected in the United States because not that there, there was certainly anti-Semitism here, but if it's not being produced in Europe, buy a beer yeah then there are not people studying it and working on it and therefore it would be rare to have it here which is why it was so unusual in 1977 at the met to suddenly have le prophet come back and given about 25 times so that was remarkable in his time but i want to conclude number one by thanking you but also saying that an experience i had reading your book was something i just alluded to that I could be reading about 1791 or 1856 or thinking about uh, his daughter, Meyerbeer's second daughter and her long life and realizing that so much of what we think about, talk about and experience today happened then. Yeah. And in reading history, it can either be a caution, it should be a caution mm. or I think the fact that we don't read enough history. Um, I chose a career in opera, but my major in college was history because I felt I needed that to be able to work in opera. And this book is a really wonderful history. And whether um, someone is a musicologist or not, I think it's important to read, not just to understand Maya Beer and his family, but to understand who we are today. Thank you so much. Thank oh. you for this wonderful visit, Elaine. And uh, the book again, Giacomo Meyerbeer and His Family, Between Two Worlds by Elaine Thornton. And keep up the good work. Thank you, <laughs> so Fred. I, can... I enjoyed talking to you so much. I did too. 